Hey everyone, and welcome back. Data Innovation Summit 2023. We're at the last panel of the event, but I think the most exciting one. We're going to be talking about important, uh, non-technical things. Maybe it will get technical. Depends if there's uh, system support for the types of things we're discussing. But uh, nevertheless, very important things. And so I have a panel of esteemed subject matter experts. Why don't we start off by introducing ourselves. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Maria Nalese. I am uh, uh, head of data analytics self-service at Ericsson, joining three years, so very much into networks and previously into private equity. But we see the common theme of data and, and AI. It, it's the same, right? It touches it's all domains? Industries. Yeah, yeah. It's all right. So very happy to be here. Cool. <laughs> and hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Salah Franceyan. I'm currently the Vice President of uh, Data Analytics uh, for the customer and physical meeting points domains in IKEA, uh, Inca, yeah, Inca Retail, uh, Inca Digital. Um, and I have a background as a mathematician, completely not applicable, um, very theoretical math. And then I've worked in finance for 12 years, uh, and I've been at IKEA for a year and a half, and it's super fun. Yes. All right. Hi, I'm Sean. I work for DataIQ, AI platform company. Uh, background as a data scientist and a data science team leader. And uh, my current job title is Field CDO. Field CEO. Yeah. <laughs> CDO. 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 They yeah. pay me to worry about the things that... Is there a back people... office CDO? <laughs> <laughs> I wish. <laughs> I have to do all the work. <laughs> and is D data or digital? I, w I wish it was digital, it's data. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I wish. So the title of this panel here is Beyond Machine Learning Models, how to build capabilities and a culture that embraces data and AI. And uh, I'm sure we all have our battlefield battles on trying to, you know, let other people see what it is that we see, the positive potential in data and in algorithms and data-driven decision making. Uh, I'm just going to kick it off with a question from the audience and I think we'll see sort of where it heads, but people are asking what are the biggest challenges organizations face in building a data-driven culture that supports the adoption and implementation of AI technologies? And uh, I, I'll, I will uh, qualify that question a little bit. Um, does that transformation happen bottom up or top down? And you're not allowed to say it depends or both or anything. Love it, pick so, a side. <laughs> what, do you, what do you say? Um. I think there's three types of challenges here. Mm. And, and usually people focus on, on one. And it's more like purely culture. But we have issues with culture. We have issues, technical issues uh, as well. Um, so I think it's important to, to, to differentiate. So some of them regarding to transformation, of course. I think when we talk about data strategy uh, um, or becoming a data-driven company or becoming AI-driven, we forget that it's not just technology that we're talking about. We're talking about probably the most impactful uh, transformation in the organizations and in our day-to-day -day since a very long time, right? So, of course, there's fear. I, I think that's fair to say, you know, fear from the unknown, fear of losing jobs. And so this lack of trust clearly uh, impacts, uh, uh, I would say. Then we have data-specific challenges, and specific for us, uh, we see issues with data quality. I don't know if you have seen it. <laughs> it's very could specific, be, be. very specific, Your very data unique. Is perfect. Yeah, yeah. Very yeah, yeah. unique. Uh, <laughs> and then, of, of course, data literacy, right? If we don't invest in data literacy, and I think we're going to talk a lot about that today, um, we'll see how hard it is to actually build a data culture that is not just you know, high level, fluffy right. strategy, but actually has some execution and traction in the ground. Okay. And then you have from a technical point of view, you know, the integrations that are needed, the compliance issues and so on. So mm. I would say three, three areas of challenges. Okay, maybe. but top down or bottom up then? Without leadership commitment, I don't think you can build a culture. To, okay, to be this honest. is good. I think, I, I, think... I, I don't think so. We're going to say that. Well, this is like a little vote here. What, what do you say, Salah? Um, it's a, it, it does actually depend on the culture of the company. Mm -hmm. I would say where I am right now, probably the bottom-up initiation 
has been quite successful. Mm -hmm. um, so having like pockets of super smart people getting frustrated, not understanding why we aren't looking at the data, and then empowering them to actually start building data products and start looking at it and sharing really important insights. Um, and I can see like just the last years, I, I have a super talented uh, leader for, for our selling and payments DNA organization. And what she did when she came in was that she started recruiting data engineers. They started building really good um, data products in the PEDEX team, so product engineering data experience. Um, and, and now that's starting to completely revolutionize how people take decisions. Um, just be, having access to that data and being able to see kind of what kind of uh, transactions our customers are doing is of course a very valuable source of information. Right. And I don't think that like the, the top layer management would ever like take the time to think about, okay, so what kind of data products do we actually need? It's right. more like yeah, that, yeah. that needs to come from the, the bottom, but then the sponsorship is great to have from the top. Do you like differentiate sort of between data products and AI products and different kinds of products like that? Is, well, is that a meaningful distinction? Well, I think data products are the foundation and, yeah. and you can have like a very small data product but build a really powerful AI uh, product on top of it. Okay. Or you can have like a, a really good foundation but very little AI. Or you can have a lot of AI but the AI is kind of not so good because the foundation yeah, yeah. isn't there. Okay. And, and I think when you start building, like it, especially in big organizations that have been around for a while, you may have some legacy, I don't know, <laughs> that happens. <laughs> no, no. Um, and, and and in order to be able to kind of tackle yeah. it, it's, it, it is a challenge because you have to modernize the legacy, um, you have to start building the data products, and you need to start building value from those data products. And sometimes it can be just like increasing data literacy so that people start using the, the information and building insights. And some, sometimes it can be like super advanced machine learning, but that's not so often. Mm -hmm. Usually it's just linear regression or, or dashboard. And, and that's where you get the initial massive value and also the buy-in. And that is super important. But like, okay, I think this is going to be controversial. I, I want to get hear your opinion. So let's, <laughs> let's pin one thing here in terms of the... I guess, and this is also going to be on the bottom up or top down, so I want to get your answer on that first and then we move on, but it seems that there are sort of caps on the amount of value that you can derive depending on how you do things. So you yep. mentioned the complexity of the model and the AI systems that you use. Um, I also think that whether you start top down or bottom up, you, there are also caps. Uh, so, top down or bottom up, which one is uh, ideal? From the side. <laughs> From the side. Oh, that's a cop out. All right, we'll, we'll save it. We'll, we'll ask it that again later. Innovative approach. Yeah. <laughs> See right here, importance of innovation. All right, all right. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what do you I say? say? Bottom up. Bottom up. And I think that's partly just my own experience of any change that I created, even if I eventually helped get top down sponsorship, it, it doesn't materialize out of, uh, out of a vacuum, right? You need to create pressure, create value, demonstrate something, and then get it. So if I, mm. if I have to choose and if I advise, you know, we have mostly large enterprise customers, it needs to be bottom up because without individuals like powering this, if it is just people from the top saying, build this or build that, and they tend not to know what to say after that, it's just build more AI or data or something and here's some money. Yeah. Uh, maybe that reflects a, a relative relatively poor top-down sponsorship that I've experienced in my life, but like, uh, especially this change and maybe what generative AI maybe helps us uh, do in terms of lifting some of those caps that you were talking about in some unexpected ways. I think it, it has to come from the people doing the work on the ground. Can, can I counter that just a little bit? <laughs> and I think it's maybe what we, what we are talking about, what is really a data culture, right? Because we all see pockets of competence and great work being happening, you know, from uh, uh, um, our data scientists. So, so, so we do have that. What, what, when I say the importance of leadership is without a clear data strategy, you know, without a really investment, uh, resourcing available, right? This, this, you will still have pockets and you still have initiatives, but the right traction and to become strategic for a corporation without the leadership, yeah. I know. I, I, but I can you name an enterprise that's done that? I, well, look, I, I would <laughs> out-counter it on a purely theoretical <laughs> level. And then whether this works or not is, is a different thing. I, I think it does work. But the, the fact is, the fact is that um, if you start bottom up and, and you start, uh, you can also think of it as like an AI that's bringing about marginal improvements or perhaps taking an existing process and improving it. 
what you're really doing is improving your profit margins. On the other side, if you have something that affects the business model, you can potentially charge more or perhaps provide a new service or yeah. something that a Open customer a new revenue more. Mm -hmm. That is uncapped. Your profit margins are capped by, mm. by definition the on the road. economic. And yeah. I suppose what's, what bothers me a lot is that we are preaching to the choir here <laughs> a little bit, right? And, and what we don't have is necessarily C-level people or boards of directors that are thinking, what kinds of services could we even offer to our customers that are entirely data-driven or insights-driven that are so valuable that customers would be willing to pay more? So like in logistics, for example, same-day delivery. You can only do that if you're organized enough to be able to do that kind of real-time management of your fleet. Is a customer willing to pay more for real-time, uh, for same-day delivery? Yeah, probably. Well, Maybe guaranteed even a lot. window the next day. Guaranteed windows, yeah. whatever that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But that's a that's a business model thing yeah, more yeah. than a than a you know a data scientist a POC type thing in yes. my mind. Yes, I agree. Yeah. But like, so one of the reasons why I wanted to join IKEA is that affordability is super high on the agenda. Yeah. So I mean, if we were to improve logistics, for instance, we wouldn't make it to as a goal to to sort of make the customer pay more. Yeah. We really want to be able to to be there for the many people. Yeah. Um, and so for us, uh, improving logistics, optimizing um, processes, it's all about keeping costs down so that we don't have to increase the prices, so that we actually. Have have the many people able to buy the products that we sell. I would and totally I, agree. I yeah. think uh, so cheaper and, and charging yeah. more is the same thing, basically. If, if your business model, mm, no, no, well, no, it's not. <laughs> from economics <laughs> standpoint, making the Model T Ford cheaper is the same thing as giving people more money. So your business model is making people afford furniture. Yeah. And so if you're making a, a furniture that somebody wants to buy more of or you're making it cheaper, it's, it's pretty much the same side of the coin. Um, In any case, if, yeah. your, if your approach is to lower the price of the furniture, yeah. that is very much aligned with the business model of IKEA. Yes. So, you know, if, if everything points in that direction, I think, I think that's a valid, you know, yeah. Uh, approach. Yeah. It's not clear to me, I, I, what, I, what I suspect is that in IKEA, that, that mission is very expressed, very succinctly expressed. And in uh, shipping companies, it's not clear to me what the goal of everything is. Uh, it's delivering packages, but is it, do we, do we charge more for delivering it on time? Do we charge more for being uh, able to deliver closer to the person's home? Do we charge more for being able to deliver heavier? Like there, there's a lot of gray zone where the question is, what is the true value of the service that we're offering? Yep. And when you have a goal that's as well expressed as the one that you mentioned for IKEA, it makes it very easy for everybody to have a culture where yep. we're all aiming in the same direction. Yep. Yeah, simplicity and cost-cautiousness are kind of uh, two of the main values that, that IKEA lives by. And I, I think it does sort of, it changes a little bit what you're optimizing towards. Right. Um, it's not necessarily making the customer, it's definitely not making the customer pay more. Yeah. It's al allowing the customer to pay less. Right. Uh, to really it's also a measurable available. thing. Yeah. So, the, well, here's a question then. Does the output have to be measurable? Yes. What are you optimizing towards if it's not measurable? I mean, I, I, I agree. I'm just trying to, trying to play my own devil's advocate here. No, I mean, no. What, does the, okay. No, no, yeah, yeah, I was joking. It has to be measurable? Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah. All right, well, I, then. I think we would agree on that. Yeah. So, and, and, but actually, it, I'm, I'm a firm believer that you change what you are measuring. So what you're measuring will, will be what people are, are aiming towards. And I think spending the time to really think about whether you're measuring the right metrics can be absolutely uh, like the, the game yeah, yeah. changer. It is. Uh, they can yeah. be more transformative on business models than any AI thing you might build. Yes. Just yeah. by actually heading towards yeah. the right yeah, target. Yeah. Defining the KPIs it. and consistently yeah. measuring that. But then again, we go back to the leadership, right? who sets them up, right? Because if you, if you say, yeah, yeah, we believe we want to have a data strategy, we want to be in the forefront, but then actually you're, what you're measuring and what you give importance is completely different. It's yeah. not going to happen. Well, yeah. we had a good uh, question here earlier about uh, setting up these measurement things because it's not always evident that what you're measuring is what you actually want to achieve. And I think at the end of the day, you take sort of a gambit and you say, well, cheapo furniture is our business model. That's what we want to do and we think that's going to work and we think that's what people want and so, we're going to go for it. But somebody gave the example of uh, showing relevant ads. Mm. And how do we measure that? Well, if they click on it, then it's relevant. Not clear that it's relevant just because somebody clicks on it. And so 
you know, how, how easy or not, or how important is it to set those goals for the company? I think that there's one misconception that of what should be measured. Mm -hmm. And it's not because something is measurable that it should be a KPI or an OKR, mm -hmm. right? I think that's very, very important to differentiate because I think we've seen an era where we wanted to measure everything. You know, how many mm. clicks, <laughs> how many forwards, how many comments, how many, but we need to understand that, okay, you can have all that, but then it doesn't impact sales, for example, or it's yeah. not impacting, so. All those KPIs on one single dashboard, the, the great, <laughs> can you just put all of the information a, a on glass one page? Right. Yeah. Right. Exactly, but then it doesn't give you anything, really, right? It's yeah. just that, oh, but, it's, but we can measure it, and then it seems very yeah. advanced, yeah. but it's not, so I think, Yes, understanding the importance of having OKRs, and I think you were, you were touching that, saying even the ones you define today, they might change, yes. right? As you, as you progress, you might want to adapt and define new OKRs and new, new targets. That is really, really important, both on a business side, and of course that is revenue streams, that could be uh, efficiency, productivity, cost savings, uh, working capital, but also from a data perspective, like li data literacy, for example. Mm. How many companies have that as an OKR, mm. right? Uh, um, so I, I would say yes, important it, to measure. It sounds like you're saying progress. something like, uh, it, rather than collecting everything, you should collect with intent. And some, yes. uh, it, it seems like some of that data needs to be designed in a sense, right? Because it, it doesn't exist, uh, <laughs> or it's, at least it's not being instrumented, or we don't know exactly what we're looking for, and that you have to sort of create the circumstances for measuring the thing that you want to measure. Yes, I think so, and I mean, sometimes it's about starting to collect data because you didn't do that before because you didn't realize that this might actually be something that could be of value. Mm. Um, sometimes it's about creating the real metrics that you actually believe are the right ones for now, and then yeah, yeah. being very clear with these are going to change as we learn, as we progress, as we mature, um, and sometimes you just need to use a proxy because it's not information that you're ever going to have. Mm -hmm. And then yeah, yeah. finding a good way of, of creating that proxy. Uh, Can you talk about that sort of more? I mean, because sometimes there's a time delay. You, yep. you guys uh, want to make cheap furniture and sometimes even high that- High quality furniture. High, high quality, affordable, <laughs> and so on. Thank you. And if you do that correctly, maybe customer behavior even changes because of you achieving the goals that you've set out. Mm. And so there's a time delay, there's a long time before you can measure the effect of a thing that you've done. Proxy variables, is that a way to, to get there? And how, how, how do you think about that? Yeah, so I mean, I'm, so I'm, I'm the, I work with the, the, my teams um, in the FedEx teams. Uh, they work with the, the web, the app, and the kind of digital touch points in the stores, uh, both for coworkers and customers. Uh, and so it, it, it really depends on what it is we're trying to do. Uh, so it could be that we're trying to really engage with a customer to understand what their needs are and, and kind of inspire them or give them very succinct information. Uh, it could be that we've just rolled out like a, a new uh, recommendation algorithm and we want to try out how good it is. And, and uh, depending on what part of the, the journey we believe they are on, either we want them to convert so they, they press and they buy and they're happy, uh, or we just want to give them a lot of relevant information about like if you're looking at a kitchen, it might take a while for you to actually buy it and you might want to mm -hmm. sw speak to a human before you do that. Mm -hmm. and, and so the, the metrics need to depend on what kind of a journey you're on. Yeah. And, and when you start out, you probably just want to have, how many people came to this website? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and if but you don't start with that, then you're kind of, <laughs> it's going to be really weird. That yeah. entire design process for that data that you just outlined yeah. though, is not something that a lot of people in the rest of this room learn as part of a data craft. They tend to need to get it from a business background, a product background, hmm. a real life background. And so what ends up happening in a lot of enterprises is instead of data being designed for a purpose to track an outcome and improve it, it's basically found data, like found art. And let's like cobble- Like a byproduct of operations that happens just to Just emissions. I, yeah. had, I had a facilitated a panel at our conference last year and someone introduced themselves as working in sanitation. <laughs> right, nice. which is like very funny and self-deprecating, but kind of like <laughs> um, kind of encapsulates a lot of the problem and a lot of the energy spent by a lot of people and vendors in this room is to try and just deal with that problem of, but what if we just went and designed the right data up front? Would everything downstream be a whole lot easier? And I think in many cases it would. Well, is it necessary to, because now you, you, when, when you described, you described uh, like a recommender system. And uh, it can be viewed in isolation, uh, but 
but it could also be viewed as part of a, a customer life cycle journey. Yep. I don't know what the cool word for it is anymore, but you know, we've been it's talking about the word. panes of glass yeah. and the life cycle. Missions. But, uh, the, the, right. journey. the journey. The journey of the customer. The missions of the customer. Can, can this Ooh. be instrumented or should it be or is it instrumented all the way so that you know that you know, your recommender system did what it was supposed to do, but at the end of the day, it's not even a customer that has gotten great value, but somebody that's at home with the furniture and is happy and hasn't called support yeah. and blah, blah, blah. You know, like the, the whole thing. Yeah. Yeah, I think what I've, so what I've been really happy about um, working in, in customer domain uh, is that we have an extremely talented, experienced design lead, um, and she's talking about life at home missions. She's like drawn up these really sort of um, compelling uh, customer journeys um, for, to, to kind of allow us to dream. Mm -hmm. uh, so when you work in, in this kind of a digital uh, company as I do, uh, you need someone who helps you to dream. Uh, because as a data scientist, I've, yeah, I'm not very good at doing nice PowerPoints, et cetera, um, and I'm not good at design. Uh, so we really partner super close with our design experience people because they, they meet the customers, they do a lot of analysis, and then we from data can help them to validate whether they're sort of, what the customers are saying can be validated in a more gen general context. Um, and I found it like super inspiring to really think about it from that perspective. Okay, so you want to buy like a, a cup. Okay, so then here's a cup. Welcome, and you're probably quite happy with that. Or it's like, um, <laughs> it's spring, I need to do something about my balcony, yeah. and it might be a bit like a larger thing. Um, and yeah, so we've been really sort of, we have excellent people working on recommendations, both content, range, price, uh, and they've kind of been really thinking about this uh, sort of, because it means that you have to optimize towards several parameters, and you need to have much more of a flexible setup from a sort of more technical viewpoint. How skilled is she in uh, data science? Who? Oh. Um, she is, uh, I would say she's very good at understanding what's easy to do and what's difficult to do. Oh, that's and interesting. that for me is the key. You don't have knowing to Knowing when scientist. you're about to get in trouble. Yeah, yeah. yeah or knowing that like this is going to be a three-year project and, yeah. and maybe yeah. the value's yeah. not there. <laughs> or like, okay, so this will probably take Sala and her team a couple yeah, of days, yeah. so let's do that. <laughs> well, maybe that she's gotten that because she's worked with you for a while, so she knows what to expect reasonably. Yeah, she's a very smart person. I mean, uh, <laughs> I, I feel like, um, that's one thing that I'm good, I know how long I take to do certain amounts of work, and when I work with people, I tend to enjoy working more with people that imagine too much, and then I can pull them down, than people that can't imagine anything, and then I need to invent stuff about a domain that I have no clue about. <laughs> you know, because it's easier for them to say, can AI do this, and I can be like, it's gonna be a little bit tough. <laughs> but it's really hard for me to say, oh, well, why don't you reorganize your, you know, your car manufacturing? <laughs> I have no, no idea about cars. So what kind of what kind of upskills do managers need to be working on immediately now to be working efficiently with their organization? If we're talking about going data driven and that kind of stuff. Like so, the C levels and the up up there, we're talking about upskilling. But what kinds of skills? For for leadership, of yeah, for, yeah, for leadership roles. Um, we actually started to 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 put together a specific program for leadership, mm. where all the initiatives that we have, because I think. Maybe you have similar experience, maybe you have, for sure. And that is, even the good things that are happening on the ground, before they can come to the leadership, you know, radar and knowledge, so much is lost on the way that maybe they think, no, we're not doing it, but we are. So just creating this awareness, I think it's really, really important. So having regular sessions on what we are doing for, you know, it could be lineage or, or regarding marketplace or strategy or, or whatever. So they actually know that this is happening. Oh, so technical? Like you teach leadership about no, data well, lineage? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, not like this is how you do no, it. No, 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 but still, but, but even the just value. the concept itself. Yeah, 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 but it's, yeah, there are ways to do it, right? You don't do it the same way. I'm not way saying as that it's not that super important. Data. I just, I, no. the leaders that I know can barely, you know, they don't, they don't know what, like if I say binomial distribution, they'll, they'll, <laughs> but I think we also are seeing a new generation of leaders, leaders yes, as well. Okay. Yeah, and that's sometimes fair. not just in age, but, but mindset, right? It could be a young person with an old mindset. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. so I would think that is definitely important that they are aware of what's happening. And then the second is the value that it brings. Because unless they understand that, they will not prioritize it as well. So I think it's, it's, it's quite important that they're not just dependent on a thousand other people to know something about what's yeah. happening in their own company uh, that is actually changing and, and, and the need are significantly, mm. right? Moving the need are significantly. You mean part so of, part a data of... literacy program for, for executives, I would definitely yeah. Yeah. Uh, support. We're seeing more of those. A lot of those are 
ground up, but some of them are targeted at executives as well. And it's even become part of my remit to basically mostly just demystify what yeah. is AI to those people. Yeah. Uh, and we're, we're using the moment of heightened public interest and maybe slightly suspended fear that generative AI publicity is giving yeah, yeah. to start offering this mostly to existing customers where we want to expand the use of data IQ um, to just help people up the top understand from an out, outside perspective, look, some of this is very complicated. Some of it you can completely understand. Um, and the, the powerful thing that we always sneak in is we talk about other companies in, in your industry that are doing stuff. I always put examples in there that are actually from the company, <laughs> but then I reveal that later. Okay, okay. On, typically when they say, we're not ready for AI and we're not doing it, I say, well, actually, half those examples you are. are your people you are. building stuff right now. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but point taken on the generational thing, and I think that, so we try to demystify people. Uh, there are certain leaders who are just not going to change how they make decisions. Right? And all of this work, putting more data, uh, more power out in the organization, out in domains, it... it, it, it can have the opposite effect, actually. It can have the opposite effect, it could, yeah. It could. I, I have to ask, because otherwise I can't stop thinking about it. Why would you talk about binomial yeah. distributions <laughs> when you're talking about data lineage? Because it's a coin flip. No, not, not about data lineage. Yeah. <laughs> it's just so random. It's like, no, it's what? just... My, my, my reaction was it's significantly above data lineage in terms of... <laughs> yeah. No, I, I really want to hear you talk I, about data lineage. I've given an example now. of an unfair coin to a decision maker, and that is the simplest statistical thing in the universe, is, 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 a, is a, an unfair coin. And I think that's, that's way above you know, lineage, the kind of yeah. stuff. But data lineage is, is <coughs> I can imagine lots of metaphors that you use to yeah, help yeah, them. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, but the, the, it's only because data lineage, when it comes to AI stuff, it ties into explainability and a bunch of other stuff. I, I know there's, the, there's like the data warehouse, data lineage aspect, mm -hmm. but, and, and sure. <laughs> but that's the hard work. That's the hard work the executive needs to understand. They don't really need to understand yeah, no, the distributions. The, the they need, need to understand the but, cost. Yeah. And we, we are in a journey for simplification also in our system landscape, yeah. again, legacy yeah. for those who <laughs> have encountered that. So that is very easy to show. For example, if you're looking for the single source of truth of data and then suddenly you have these scattered systems, right? And the time that it takes to understand where is data coming from, who owns it. So there are ways to do that. I think from a self-service perspective that I'm coming from, yeah. it's all about not how do you enable or empower the engineers and the scientists, but really, you know, the business people, how to use uh, uh, data and analytics in a very yeah. self-sufficient, confident, feeling empowered, data-driven, uh, data but also value-driven results, mm. so. Yeah, and I think, because for me, having worked in slightly large organizations, it's all about managing expectations. Um, and so at, at SEB, when I was still working there, we did this really fun uh, exercise with, with our, um, the, the higher management, where we, we printed out a page with like, uh, I think 20 columns, 10 rows, and, and names, uh, postal addresses, tax addresses, um, with, with not perfect data. And then we asked them to, <laughs> to pick the, the customers that were located in Stockholm that would be relevant for a specific campaign. Mm. And it was so good because they started having those important discussions about, okay, okay so is it the postal address or is it the tax address? And you know, oh, oh. it is, I mean, data quality and, and working yeah. with data, it, it's, it requires skills. Mm. And I heard, um, I, this is, uh, I'm not completely objective because it was a Finnish person um, from ULE, the Finnish broadcasting company. And he was saying that when they started their data strategy, they first talked to the stakeholders and asked, what do you need? Mm. Um, and then they started hiring not data stewards, but responsible analysts. Mm. And I just love that name, because I've been trying, like I've been trying like data detective, just analyst, <laughs> because you're actually working with the data. Yeah. Uh, you know, yeah, yeah, but responsible yeah. analysts, I like that, because it, it, it makes it clear that this is a very highly qualified job. It's super yes. difficult. Mm. Not a leftover, yeah. No, it's, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's not like bringing a junior and let them fiddle around. Clean it, it, the data. Yeah, yeah it's really finding the people it. that yeah. are passionate about the data that they're working on. And making on. sense out of data, right? Yes. I, I think it's, uh, yeah. it's not nothing, right? No. It's, um, mm. So I think there are ways that you can uh, make it into like a bit of a fun game and, and also at the same time, like 
illustrate that it's some parts are difficult and they take time and it is sort of annoying. Um, and and but there are things that you can do in the meanwhile. Like you can use this for marketing or you can use this for for software things. And then as you progress, maybe at the end you can have like I don't know AI for finance. Yeah. Um, but but we're everyone's far away from that. There's yeah. no one that could do that today. But okay, let, let's uh, let's <clears throat> argue about this because I think it's always more fun to watch people argue. <laughs> uh, maybe this is hypothetical exercise here. What's what's reasonable to expect a, a leadership team to learn and that kind of stuff? I'm trying to think of. Let's say you're doing customer segmentation, and uh, to your example of of or whether it's data lineage or, or whatever, I feel like it's more reasonable to expect a leadership group to understand the principle of that you can cluster customers, and don't worry exactly how, how that algorithm works, it will tell you how many customer segments that are distinct with a certain uh, confidence level, and then given that information, you can make an informed decision. But uh, sort of having them have, uh, I'm not saying this is what you're suggesting, but like uh, having them sort of understand exactly how hard it is to, to uh, decide which customer to, to run a campaign on or how they should be segmented, I just don't think they have the, the tools for that. That, that they're, It's better no. to let like an analyst do that kind of stuff and let the CEO not be in the dark, but you know, understand more the principles of the output rather than yeah. the me methods of the input somehow. What do you so, th yeah, so the, the reason why we wanted to do that exercise was that we wanted to do proper expectation management. Okay, yeah. Because uh, they were getting really like, oh, but why don't we have good customer data? We should just do it, you know? And, and we were like, we are doing it. Okay. But it's going to take some time, yeah. and and this is what our people are doing. Yeah. And then, of course, you can use machine learning and stuff to to sort of quicken up the process, and yeah. you can do a lot of uh, smart things to to improve on the quality, like for the future. But expectations is good. Maybe yeah. maybe we, that's a word that's that uh, w w you know. Yeah, I think we can you said that too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's our common. I was going to say, great idea. <laughs> <laughs> so expectations on what? On how long things will take? On and outputs, the complexity. Yeah. On the complexity. I think the complexity and the other thing is the interdependency of things, right? You cannot not care about your data platform, mm. but then demand that, you know, the, the output or the, the end result should be there, you know, immediately and fresh data and reusability. And so, so I think, yeah, expectations on the complexity and the interdependency mm. of, of things, I think it's quite important that they are aware. But not thought, you know, that how hard it is and what kind of validation or preparation. Yeah. yeah. No, yeah. no, yeah. not at this level. Yeah. I don't think any yeah, of but us. So they sh understand the, the scale of investment, mm. but also the path of investment that you're yeah. proposing. Because if you just use that to kind of build up the scale of the investment and ask for lots of money, uh, then they'll give know. you lots of money all in one go and then expect a lot of stuff almost immediately. Yeah. And yeah, so yeah, yeah, typically yeah. what the expectation happen. management we have to do as, as a vendor is over time, you'll get this value, and yes, it will cost you a lot of money to get that value, but don't don't start there. Don't start with the big bang. Everything you've ever tried to do about yeah. building stuff, don't do it that way. Start with start with these small things. Yeah, incremental, and that, incremental. That's incremental. often harder for leadership to get their head around that they should start with small investments that accumulate and help the next investment pay off. It, it sounds really good to me, as I say it, but it's that, that's often a little bit unfamiliar to people who are honestly compared to what's spent on the tools in this room, they're used to spending so much more on other things. So sometimes I also wonder, do we make it sound too small and, and yeah. feasible and easy compared to how much money and time and resources they shove at other parts of the business? That might be a, a good indicator. What's the percentage of your budget that actually is going into you know, data-driven initiatives or AI-driven initiatives? Not a bad measure. measure. That would be yeah. interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but uh, I have this kind of uh, pet peeve when it comes to, to building like data analytics organizations and products and, and things. In every part of IT, everybody's talking about microservices. So we want to build small things that we can launch and then scale and, and maintain and then kill and you know do proper lifecycle management. And, and DNA is still, like data analytics is still so immature that I think a lot of, uh, especially smaller companies, they don't really have the, the money to have these like uh, vast uh, skilled sets of people that are building the data analytics. They end up buying monoliths and then they're stuck. Uh, and, and so it really reminds me of like uh, the, the beginning of the internet when people were building monolith websites. 
Uh, and then you're like, oh, we need to change this part of the website. Okay, we have to wait till next year. It'll be fine. Change everything to change that one thing. Yeah. yeah. So I, I think, like, for me, I, I'm a super fan of open source. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> super fan of so open source, super fan of building small, scalable things that you can then, you start small, you learn, yeah. you add new data sets, and, and you use that to inform your data strategy as well. So you don't start with, like, building the perfect data foundation with every single data point you have. Yeah. But you actually start with, where is the value? What is it our customers yeah. need? What is our stakeholders need? How can we start there. This is a recurring theme in these panels, and I was going to shove this theme into this discussion, but you brought it up, so here we are. <laughs> what about technical debt? I, I've been, we've been talking, okay, this is something I've been saying, and I think I've, I've gotten a lot of sort of uh, response on it. People agree that, you know, if you don't have to install the Titanic to do your project and realize the value of that project, and that you, you, you sort of need to justify this platform one piece at a time. You don't have to do data, you don't have to have the platform to do data science. But, and this is where I can uh, uh, cast shade on the IT folk, finally. It's <laughs> mostly, mostly the people people, but in this case it's the engineers that are always complaining about technical debt. And I don't think technical debt really is an issue. If you have something that's generating money, it might eat into your margins, and you might want to do things more efficiently, and so you should redesign it the right way, but as long as, as the, the value is justified ahead of time. Because that's the problem if you make a project where you start spending money and then you're gonna, it's a POC, a proof of a concept that maybe this is valuable, and then it's not valuable, but you know, you're already burning money, that, that, then you're in trouble. So what, what is your take on, on, on uh, cause the management and the data, the, the people people, aren't worrying about technical debt, but that is the only thing IT people are saying. We have to do it the right way. We have to set up this platform and everything. What, what is your sense of, of whether there's a truth to that or not? I think that things that are working and generating value, yeah, keep them going. I think what, to your point about the monolith, what scares the shit out of data people and keeps them up at night and gets them talking about technical debt is when uh, and to your point about dependencies, when there's something that has been around a long time that is no longer generating value, but lots of other things depend on that thing to generate value, and then the benefit of the thing is getting divorced from the maintenance cost of that core component or that, that, that yeah, one that, mapping spreadsheet great, in the middle uh, of everything. Great reflection. And so it's, yeah, we... I have a credit card. I don't mind having debt as long as I have a plan to pay it off, right? And it's, yeah. it's useful to me. Yeah. Uh, when people get into trouble with personal debt is when they're using one uh, bucket of debt to finance another one, and yeah. then they get underwater very quickly, and it's very, still a little easy for that to happen yeah. in data land. Yeah. That might be why we talk about it so much. Is, is this a new concept? I'm thinking in like complex... Uh, you know, car manufacturing or Ikea, or what, what, where you have chains of dependencies like that, and, mm -hmm. and uh, there has to be physical Analogs, uh, technical yeah, yeah. debt somehow mm -hmm. that is equivalent. How do you manage those kinds of uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm not, rationalizations? Yeah, I'm not responsible for engineering, uh, yeah. <laughs> and I'm not even an engineer, I'm a mathematician. Okay. <laughs> but I can try to give you some sort of an answer. Um, yeah, I mean, so, just from from like my aggregate experience from from working in enterprises, I think what was happening until maybe the 2000s was that tech wasn't changing that quickly necessarily. So you had companies that were quite comfortable sort of running the one year upgrade for for the systems that they'd had since the 70s. Everything was super stable, stable very robust. And then started that we started like the iPhone, the cloud, loads of new tech and, and opportunities. And, and then companies started to a little bit panic that they were going to le get left out. So they invested in these massive transformation projects and, and tended to not maybe always complete them completely because uh, it's uh, way too challenging. And so I think now with the kind of this agile way of working, trans transforming to more of a sort of microservice DevOps uh, perspective, at least it starts to take care of the problem but it's still going to be there for probably 10 or 20 more years. Mm. And after that, we'll probably have a problem with DevOps being obsolete or something, I don't know. Um, <laughs> we will have just caught up, and that's already yeah. not cool yeah. anymore. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I think, yeah, but I mean, yeah, just this is completely off topic, but I think I, what I'm excited about when it comes to like large language models and, and the latest sort of hype is that I actually think it's going to make programming easier. 
uh, and it's hopefully going to make it more st stable and more for robust for programmers. For, for experts or for noobs yeah, or experts? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, if it was noobs, then you, you don't know what it's created, and you're like, I hope it's okay. Well, I mean, I had a friend that, I think they installed AutoGPT, and uh, this person doesn't know any programming, mm. and they just, they generated a website, they, they made tons of stuff, yeah. and I thought it was very cool. Yeah, and then you have guy. me, and ChatGPT is cheating for me and helping me debug stuff and everything, and it's, I think it's amazing, and Copilot too. Yeah, my colleague uh, asked it to build uh, an algorithm, and it, it wasn't, it wasn't great. <laughs> no, but it's like having a friend on the phone that can't see your screen, but you can ask for advice. Yeah, That's how so, I see so it. weird limitations and no accountability. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Right? So, so <laughs> if you use it, it like that, yeah, yeah, yeah that's yeah. fine. Yeah, 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 yeah. And you forget you have an NDA, so you tell them all about the new product that's <laughs> yeah, going to exactly. come out well, and everything. <laughs> yeah. yeah. What do you think about technical debt then? Um, I really like this, This it's not generating value anymore, but you have other things that are generating value, but we don't, that we don't, we don't make a map. Not transferring yeah. value and cost between different yeah. parts of a data product yeah. stack. Yeah, but, but we don't have a, a method, or at least that I know of, that, that's very popular for rationalizing costs in a, in a cost lineage way. <laughs> Right? We do. We, we okay. are doing that more do. and more, right? I think we are doing that more and more. Even when we have systems in, in capacity mode, mm. we are trying to find a way to charge back to who, those who consume it, right? In right. the same proportion. So yeah. I think we're very much going into that direction. I can tell you from self-service, we have maybe 80% mm. of everything we have today, which is around 10 different products, for example, serving 40,000 people at Ericsson, 80% mm. should be in charge back. So okay. it is possible to do, but I think this value approach is quite recent, mm. that everything, you know, moving from being a cost center to, to a value center is quite new, so we're starting to do that. I think your point is, is really spot on. What exactly qualifies as a, a technical uh, debt, yeah. right? What, what is that? Is that because no one uses it? Because it could be, and we are, at least in, in, in our company, we're very good at onboarding new systems. We're not as good <laughs> at closing yes. them, yeah. right? So some, sometimes, yes, there could be dependencies and then there's not really depth there. It's just the way you calculate the value is, is separated from the cost. But in other cases, uh, uh, what you see is that you're very eager, okay, what's the next one? So, for example, this year, one of my OKRs is how many systems we're closing. Nice. Yeah. I have, I'm, I'm measuring <laughs> literally, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. I, 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 one of my bosses, the, the moment I knew I really wanted to work for her was when she said, yeah, I knew that if I asked people, do you still want these reports out of this old thing, they'd all say yes, yes, yes. So I engineered an outage. She engineered an outage. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. But and we then did, waited yeah. to see who We have done woke a similar yeah. thing as well. We just, we asked and everyone said, no, no, we need it. Say, okay, then we just move them. <laughs> oh, but we just stopped sending them. And then we waited <laughs> to see who reacted. Exactly. Who's going to react? And, we yeah. one. We had those ones and the new reports. Things. It was just one. Yeah, yeah, we had yeah. the same. We had, we moved and yeah, yeah. yeah. I heard the most genius suggestion ever, uh, almost a year ago now, and it was, uh, a woman that works at Talia who was a boss of a large organization and we were talking about whether or not you can automate certain roles and she has lots of direct reports. And she was saying that, you know, if you ask any of her engineers uh, how, how easy it would be to automate what they do, they say, well, I just do so many things. It's basically impossible to automate what I do. And then mm -hmm. she was like, okay, cool. I'll give you a year off and a raise. <laughs> if you can automate. And then they started getting so creative, they're like, actually, you know, it is a couple of things, but I think I can do at least 90% with this <laughs> shell script, and then the rest I'll do, yeah. you know. Okay, so when it comes to sort of creative weird stuff, LLMs is all the rage. We've actually mentioned it in this, we have about a minute left. I want to hear your sense of, is it just a cool chat bot, or is there something to it that's going to fundamentally change the way we work? Have we, is this a new paradigm shift, yes or no? What do you say? Yes, but not in the ways that people think it's going to be today. <laughs> okay, moderate. <laughs> what yes, do you say? Yes, in, in ways that we want and also all kinds of unexpected ways. Unpredictable too. ways. Yeah. On the whole, good or bad? I'm incredibly more positive about it. Six, six months ago, I thought it was just about generating art images and stuff. Mm. And now I'm starting to see what people are doing and I'm starting to see this creativity, especially about people changing their own job. Mm. And when people change, start changing their own job and upgrading their own job, 
that's just a really powerful thing in human that's history. That's really neat. I think everybody should, should feel like it's possible for them to try this out and get a sense of it themselves. What, what do you say? Do you, is it hype or is yeah, it substance? Yeah, I, I agree. I, I think it is, uh, uh, it is going to change the way we work, and, but in many ways different than what people expect. Yeah. I, I, I totally agree. We're actually quite aligned here. Next time we need to... <laughs> I know. I know. This is the we good thing. We're trying to keep the but we still... But <laughs> yeah. We can't seem to find a way. We couldn't even fight about technical debt. Yeah, yeah exactly. We... So maybe there's not quite as much outrage as uh, Aftenbladet and all these af uh, magazines want it, want it to seem like. <laughs> Well, a positive outlook, and there's a yeah, lot of yeah, work to do, sure. and it's going to turn out good if we put our minds to it. All right. <laughs> Thanks, everybody, for joining. This panel went really quickly and was uh, the most pleasant and fun one Yay. so far. <laughs> That's <laughs> us. Excellent. Thank you. All right. Thank well, you. join us uh, shortly for another interesting session. I'll see you soon. Thanks, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you.